From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Good afternoon, welcome to the afternoon session of the Kern County Board of Supervisors on this, the 25th day of September, 2018. The board will reconvene. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Gleason. Here. Supervisor Scrivener. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Mr. Um, we have a report on actions taken in closed session. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. There are no reportable actions from the closed session. Thank you, sir. We're going to begin our afternoon looking at our consent agenda. Consent items are considered to be routine by staff and are generally voted on all at once. Uh, th there will be an opportunity for the public to make comment or ask a question about items on consent. And if a member of the board wishes to pull an item, that can be done. So if you follow along with me, if, if you're looking at an agenda, uh, they're at the back corners of the room if you'd like to pick one up. But you can um, follow along with me. The consent items begin on page two with items three and four. Then on to page three, items five, six, eight, and nine. On page four, items 10 through 13, but I need to uh, indicate that item number 10 is being pulled by staff for a separate uh, consideration. So item 10 will not remain on the consent calendar. Item 10 is not on consent, but 11, 12, and 13 are. On page five, all the items 14 through 16. On page six, items 17 through 19 are on consent. Are there any members of the public that, that can come forward, sir? Uh, any members of the public that would like to? Oh, I missed some? Oh, sorry. They're not highlighted this time, and I missed them. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm, I'm just a second, Mr. Parr. On page 6, items 17, 18, 19, and then 21, 22, and 23. On page 7, all the items 24 through 29. And on page 8, items 30 through 32. Those are all on consent. There's another page. There you go, 30, 33 through 36. Well, I probably can thoroughly confuse you, and I apologize if that's the case. Item number 10 is not on consent, and we're going to deal with that separately in a moment. So are there any members of the public that would like to ask a question about an item that is on consent? I think, Mr. Farr, you have a, a question, and uh, Mr. Fox, I believe, has one. So would you like to go first, Mr. Mr. Uh, Farr? Good afternoon, sir. Could you give us your name for the record? I know you've been with us before, but... Um, my name is Clark Farr, uh, Bakersfield resident. Um, I'm, uh, you don't have to actually pull item 19. I have some comments with regards to item 19, which is, a, uh, uh, is identified as an agreement um, to submit a, uh, um, a signed document uh, to the, uh, with regards to federal regulation uh, uh, CFR or 44 CFR 6510. Um, it's actually not an agreement and it really only affects uh, Supervisor Maggard's district. Um, what it deals with is about a one mile uh, levy that begins at its upstream end. Um, ah, my brain's just going blank here. It doesn't matter. It's a one mile levy that protects Oildale um, on the north side of the Kern River. Uh, to begin with, I, I have to note that when we deal with levees, the uh, first state engineer for California uh, was uh, w once said that there are only two types of levees, uh, those that have failed and those that will fail. Um, and this levy is no different. However, uh, in this case, it has been identified in the past as protecting portions of Oildale, large portions of the southerly portion of Oildale. Um, and now FEMA has finally gotten around to getting a certification on this particular levy. Uh, it was built, I believe, in the late 40s, early 50s, and may actually have been built prior to Lake Isabella. I don't know my history on that levy all the, um, to that degree. Um, 
what has happened is the uh, city of Bakersfield has taken over the responsibilities from and has uh, taken away uh, and eliminated the necessity for the Kern River uh, Maintenance District that had responsibility for maintaining this particular levy and other levies along the river. Um, they now have the responsibility for maintenance of a levy that only protects unincorporated areas. They did this so that they would have unfettered control of the Kern River and all the benefits that come with that. Um, now they have a, a, uh, a cost that comes with it as well. And that cost is that that levy has to now be um, engineer uh, certified to meet its responsibilities. I have several questions with regards to that that you can then send back to staff. It doesn't uh, slow up the necessity to sign this document, which uh, the city of Bakersfield needs to send off to FEMA in the next three days. I'm not looking to delay that process nor eliminate the opportunity to get the, um, uh, what is it referred to here, a PAL, a uh, provisionally accredited levy that would then hold for the next two years. That's all fine. Don't want to stop that. But um, my questions are, did the County Public Works apply due diligence and determination that the levy meets the criteria set for 44 CFR 6510 Part B, which is the design criteria? What they're having the, the, uh, uh, your CAO sign is to the best of his knowledge. Now, the best of his knowledge is a very wonderful term. It, it uh, um, is, is uh, very weaselly and it allows for uh, um, uh, credible uh, uh, deniability uh, in the case that somebody wants to come back and say you lied, um, which he wouldn't be, unless, of course, you use the due diligence that any government agency should do. Um, uh, so the letter has been sent to, or will be signed by the CAO. It's a form letter that gets attached to the city's application. Within that design criteria, there are certain responsibilities. First is freeboard. That requires that the, the water surface of the river be a minimum of three feet, four feet within 100 feet of uh, the North Chester Bridge. Um, from my recollection, it doesn't have anywhere close to that. Maybe, maybe one or two foot of freeboard. It's never been tested, so it's really not necessary to, to discuss, well, it survived this event or that event. It's never been tested because Lake Isabella does exist, but Lake Isabella, as you've probably heard, uh, has some design prob problems and could very easily have to go to their design discharge, emergency design discharge, which is 10,200 CFS. Um, to be able to draw down the lake so that it does not cause a massive failure of the lake and the dam or the dam and, and the and the lake then visit Bakersfield in a rather disturbing fashion. Um, in addition to that, the Corps of Engineers did a study of the watershed that goes from the lake down to the canyon mouth and determined that the the flow would be about 15,000 cubic feet per second. Now that would be more of a surge come and go, less of a problem. The 10,200 is a real problem because it could sustain for multiple days and could destroy levees just because of the fact it gets it wet. Doesn't necessarily have freeboard, may not have freeboard at all. That may be a problem, especially when you consider that when the original study was done, the river itself was at a different geometry. It was at a certain level. And since then, it's A-graded, which meant it went up, it's degraded, it's A-graded, it's degraded. You don't know where that level is, and it may be that the river itself has much less capacity today than when it was first built. Second issue is closures. There's no closures. There's no openings that go into that, across that levy, so that one isn't really a problem. Embankment protection, major issue on that levy. At best, the embankment has rubble dumped sporadically along its face. Rubble is not bank protection. Riprap can be, but rubble is just odd-sized rock that's just dropped there to cause problems for those who have to actually deal with it uh, during a flood. Um, uh, it's not embankment protected, or the embankment is not protected. Um, I believe the levee is built directly upon pre-existing river overbank, which is the way things were done back in the 40s and 50s. And every levee in California that was built that way has been decertified. All those along the San Joaquin River, the Sacramento River, in the Sacramento area have all been decertified because they do not have a foundation underneath them. 
as a point of interest. If you go 100 yards, 110 yards, upstream of Hart Street along that levee, you'll find a swamp on the north side of the levee. That swamp is there because water is infiltrating under the levee. That shouldn't be occurring. That means there's no foundation underneath that levee, which means the levee is going to be decertified. Um, embankment, foundation, and stability. The levee is built upon river sand, and as such, if there's water in that levee and an earthquake happens, there is a high probability of liquefaction and the levee just disappearing, just not there anymore. Um, that's a problem, and thus it needs to be designed accordingly, and I doubt it ever was. Um, the settlement issues, it's been there. It's probably not subject to settlement, but there is a, a need for an engineering analysis, and as far as interior drainage, the county does have uh, uh, drainage facilities on the upstream side, the Hart Street drain and pump stations. Um, the, uh, the questions that I have, Deal with that. That uh, um, uh, deal with the counties and or the city's um, uh, um, ability and or want to deal with anything. I mean, will Tandyland perform the studies necessary um, without county participation? When it's necessary to have that uh, the flood study done to show where the water surface is, when it's necessary to have the, geo, the geotechnical studies done without the county's part on a levy that only protects unincorporated. Will the city do that without county participation? And when will that, those things happen? Um, uh, it, as, as you all know, when it comes to, the, uh, to Tandyland Enterprises, the only thing the only time they ever give to the county is when they put a $1 uh, stamp on a bill that they send you, okay? They don't do anything for free when it comes to the unincorporated. They won't hear either. They might prove me wrong. That'd be a wonderful thing. I enjoy being proven wrong. Um, unfortunately, it isn't, doesn't happen often enough, or at least that I recognize often enough. Um, uh, remember, they, uh, they have already discussed the fact that they are the Kern River Levy District. They um, uh, have done some maintenance, but it hasn't been anything to take care of the problem. Uh, will they accept the costs that come uh, with that ownership of the, of the levy? Time will tell. But remember, too, that that area north of the river gets uh, uh, its mapping changed in two years, two years and three days from today. The mapping will change, um, and, and that will be disastrous for those, the people who don't have high incomes that's the low income, lowest income area um, in Oildale. Uh, the uh, main question is when the levy is found to be deficient, who will bring it into compliance? If the levy isn't any good, who's gonna pay to make it work? Um, is that gonna be the county? Is that gonna be the city? Is that gonna be some joint powers? Now's the time to start finding that out because you only have two years to make the repairs before the, the people and the residents of Oildale get nailed with very expensive insurance. Um, will Tandy Land wait until the last minute to perform the studies required? Uh, from what I can tell, they waited till the last minute to send the request for this letter to be signed. Um, I mean, you're getting it three days before it's gotta be to FEMA. Um, that you know, meant they probably only sent it over two to three weeks ago and they probably had it for two months. So. You know, is the city, as is their method of operation, going to wait until the last second to do anything, leaving you no time whatsoever to uh, protect the people um, within your district? Uh, will Tandyland wait until last minute, uh, leaving county residents? We're really talking about the area south of Beardsley when you are um, on the west side of Chester and south of McCord when you're on the east side of North Chester. Um, I looked at uh, Google Earth before I came here. And it showed what I, or it reminded me of what I already knew, and that was at the south end of Hart Street, that area is two feet perched, which means it is two feet below the bed of the river, which means the homes that are built there that are built pretty much on grade are two feet below the bed of the river. The river is probably at flood stage somewhere around six foot deep, which means those homeowners in that area will be paying for insurance of nine feet of water, which means they will not be able to afford it. 
period. It will cost, an, well, an arm, a leg, first two male children, and a grandchild to, to be announced later. Um, it is not in their best interest. Um, in short, will anything but be done to bring the uh, levy protecting Oildale into compliance before it's too late? And beyond the FEMA certification, assuming that, you, that the city is able to lie to, the, to FEMA about this levy and, and FEMA buys it, there still is an underlying concern that the levy may very well fail when it is tasked upon to operate, which means residents within Supervisorial District 3 will take eight foot of water through their windows, the tops of their doors, and through their homes. If, um, if that is not a reason to have the county investigate uh, separate from the, uh, from the city, I, I don't know what else is, but I would recommend that uh, um, this be placed in a high priority position um, as soon as possible for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farr. In a second, I'll have Mr. Pope give a response. Mr. Fox. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board. I'm Dennis Fox. And uh, I'm here on item 2930, which has to do with uh, motorcycles. And I'll give you a quick background. This is FYI. For several years ago, the Bureau of Land Management operated a motorcycle area up in San Benito County. And it was a nice place to ride. It was no trees and brush to get in your way. It was all nice white soil. The soil was called asbestos. So they got these little kids riding around on that. They put little signs. If you get rid of it. Well, they finally the EPA nailed them and they closed it down. Well, the motorcyclists had no place to go. But also, the BLM and their wisdom at the Sierra Club came over from the coast and over at Carissa Plains took the uh, barbed wire fences down so it would be more natural. And there was a problem there. What happened? All the motorcycles decided that was the place to go. And of course, that was a place the BLM says, we got to get rid rid of the cows because cows galloping caused valley fever. So <laughs> the BLM got the county of Kern, this board, to um, back their proposal to put motorcycles over behind Taft and Maricopa, which is on their own maps rife with valley fever. So I think it's just something to remember when you get involved in that. I don't think it's too much of a risk issue, but I, with the uh, sheriffs driving over there, I see no reason for them to give our uh, deputies a good case of valley fever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Any other members of the public have a question about an item on consent? Before we vote on the consent calendar, Mr. Pope, could you please give us a response to Mr. Farr's question about whether or not we have applied due diligence in the determination that the levy meets the criteria set forth in this section that he quotes? And if it is ever found to be deficient, who will bring it into compliance? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Fenton. Good to have the overhead on this to show location. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, the item before you today, and I'll just kind of paraphrase, I appreciate Mr. Mr. Farr's comments. Um, the, the two levees along the north and south side of the Kern River from Manor Street to the Callaway Weir, that does pro provide flood protection. Those levees are owned by the city. Um, today, I've asked your board to authorize uh, Mr. Alsop to sign, it's really a, a letter of acknowledgement, more so than an agreement, just acknowledging that we're aware of this change, that the city is going to be working on this, but it does impact the county since there are county residents that are protected by those levies um, owned by the city. 
the items that Mr. Farr brought up as far as free board, embankment protection, foundation stability, settlement, et cetera, that's why we have two years or the city has two years to verify that it meets the requirements in the federal regs uh, to certify that. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. That's why they're allowing, I think, September 28th of 2020 to provide that documentation. But today's item is just acknowledging that we're aware that that's in the works and we're an impacted community. And of course, we'll be working closely with the city and monitoring progress uh, to make sure everything comes out okay. To my knowledge, I have no reason to think that it does not comply. Mr. Farr seems to have a different opinion, uh, but that's what these studies will, will identify. And will we have an opportunity to confirm that the city will uh, provide maintenance of that in the event that it? We will be communicating with the city to find out the details, how the study is going, if there's any issues and concerns, um, and get out in front of it best we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fenton. Okay, uh, the public had an opportunity to ask about items on consent. Item number 10 is not on consent. Is there a motion then from the board to approve the consent calendar as it's been modified? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Thank you. We're going to hear public presentations at the end of this afternoon's session. Uh, so next we go to item number two, which is an opportunity for board members to make a report or announcement. Colleagues, do you have anything you'd like to say this afternoon before we proceed? Okay, thank you. I'm going to use the chairman's discretion because item number seven is going to take a little while. We're going to proceed with item number 10, the item that was pulled from consent, because I think it's a relatively um, uh, quick matter, and then those that are here for that can go on about their business. So, Ms. Ovia, uh, let's start with item number 10 then, which is a public hearing for a proposed amendment to the County of Kern fiscal year 2018-19 uh, uh, annual action plan for community development programs. Ms. Ovia. Good afternoon, Chairman Maggots, members of the board. This is a community development economic development project. So uh, we do receive uh, money from the federal government through our housing and urban development, and my department has a division that manages this. There is a requirement of your board to do economic development, and there has been uh, approximately $400,000 that was set aside over the past few years for these projects, and Teresa Hitchcock and her team has been working diligently to find a project that would bring together their community partners that would satisfy the requirements of the federal program. And some of the requirements are is that they have to produce jobs or they have to maintain jobs for our um, uh, certain categories of people. These are the homeless, veterans, low income, disabled. And I am very pleased today to bring forward to you the first installment of this is a commitment of $220,000 along with other commitments that Ms. Hitchcock can uh, more accurately describe, and she does have a presentation and some of the partners here today on this uh, project which is called Recycling Lives. Good afternoon, Ms. Hitchcock. Good afternoon, Chairman Maggard, members of the board. And first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, that this, act, this program is actually the vision of Saul Moretti. Saul is in the audience today. <laughs> I shall get and, to see <laughs> So I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that um, Saul actually came to me with this project probably about 18 months ago. And um, at that time, he had started a nonprofit in order to um, have this program move forward. And he approached us about taking over in order to, um, to grow the program further. So re Recycling Lives, the idea behind Recycling Lives is to provide intensive training opportunities for some of the hardest to employ folks in our community, including those who are homeless or re-entering society after incarceration. So this program is not unique. It has actually been done before. Saul was involved with the program in Albuquerque that did similar um, activities. And there's also a program in Hawaii. One of my employees had actually approached me about doing this program here in Kern County based on a similar program that he saw while he was vacationing in Hawaii. And little did he know that Saul had already approached us. So everything 
um, seem to come together. So a tremendous amount of money is being spent on training, counseling, legal assistance, housing assistance, mental health, all with the aim of equipping our homeless population and recently incarcerated to be successful. But after they are done with their counseling and assistance and aid, they still lack one essential item to stay out of jail, off the street, or in housing, and that's a job. They often, more often, lack the job skill and experience to get a job. Recycling Lives is that solution. Recycling Lives will offer paid job skills training in order to help these folks move forward with their lives. Recycling Lives is also the solution to the glass recycling problem. Glass is problematic for recyclers, even though the state does give CRV value for them, glass comes from cheap natural resources and thus has low value. It takes tremendous amounts of energy to heat it back up to be recycled and it costs a fortune to transport this very heavy material to market. With Recycling Lives, we will change all of these dynamics. We create a product that adds value. We do not need to reheat it to melt it. We don't need to ship it to markets out of town. Here's the centerpiece of what we're trying to do. With a glass pulverizer, we will create a new product, a recycled glass landscape mulch and glass sand. Both have available markets, but the mulch is currently where the focus is. A 50 pound bag of glass mulch can sell for as much as $108. As we create a local market for this, we will generate revenue, revenues, and these revenues can be used to replicate the program in other areas of the county. In addition, we will pursue other sources of funding, including grants and private donations to support the program and other services to ensure our participants' success. Recycled glass is safe to touch, safe to walk on, and safe to drive on. This program is actually built on a new way of reversing poverty. According to Leela Jana in her book, Give Work, Giving dignified, steady, fair wage work is the most effective way to eradicate poverty. And for those of you who haven't seen her book, it's really um, an interesting take on how to reverse poverty in um, struggling areas. This program provides an opportunity to connect to our independent contractors, the folks we see around here with their shopping carts, legging their valuables and their recyclables with them. That's our recycling program. We're trying to recycle lives here. Glass is just the medium. The goal for outreach will be to feed them, know them by name, talk to them, get them coming in to bring us glass that they've collected for cash, and it'll be easy for, uh, easier for us to collect glass that way as well. So I want to talk a little bit about the actual program, and I have with me today Jody Luffler and Mark Wyatt. Do you want to come up? with Bakersfield Adult School, as well as Bill Rector with West Tech. These are the folks who will actually be providing the job training and the hands-on training in this program. So this program is built on partnership and collaboration with a multitude of training partners and other agencies. And there are also a ton of job opportunities that this program will train for. For instance, as we collect glass from restaurants and other suppliers, we'll set up routes which creates jobs for drivers and helpers. And there's also jobs um, as we set up the pulverizer, feeding the conveyor, running the equipment, moving the finished product, delivering the product to buyers, to landscapers, to people's yards, and selling the product. There are jobs in the office teaching um, administrative skills and supervisory skills. What we don't make enough of ourselves, like that gorgeous blue glass, we will buy wholesale and sell retail, more jobs. Our contracts in the community take it a step further, teaching truck driving skills, recycling center skills, landscaping skills, and who knows what else. More jobs, landscaping, landscape design, landscape application, landscape jobs, sales jobs, marketing jobs. In addition to all of the other benefits already mentioned, glass landscape saves, mulch saves water without compromising beauty. With the drought so recently passed, we all know we now live in a desert, that water is scarce, and that we need to use less water on our lawns and landscapes. Recycled glass landscape mulch needs no water and doesn't need maintenance either. And it's beautiful. Because glass is translucent, we can do things with glass that we can't do with anything else. I can't wait to see what kind of landscapes are created in this community by our homeless workers, by the businesses, and by designers. 
So in summary, our goal with this program is to take a waste item, glass, and turn it into jobs, generate income for disadvantaged communities, save water, create beauty, recycle, put the homeless people in homes, and help parolees stay out of jail. And with all of that, we hope to save the community law enforcement resources, HUD resources, and beautify the community all at the same time. We, as a collaborative partnership, will succeed. We will build this, they will come, and from there, you just have to imagine. But it starts here, now, and with us. And with that, I'd like to ask Mark to say a few words because he's been my partner in crime on some other training programs as well. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Teresa. Um, we're, I'm the principal at Bakersfield Adult School, Mark Wyatt. And we do work with the county on some other uh, projects where we provide the jail education at Laredo. And we also started Cafe 1600 at the Employers Training Resource. And both of these programs have been very successful, or very successful. And we're very excited about working with Teresa on this next project. There's a lot of challenges to the project, but it's a definitely challenge worth the effort. And with the, the people that we will be serving uh, are those that are in most in need. Uh, it's also very exciting to work with Bill Rector at West Tech. This is really the first time we've had kind of multiple partners. It's usually been us in the county or us and, and, a, and a certain county entity. Um, so we're very excited about the partnership. And uh, like I said, we're looking forward to the challenges and uh, we think we're gonna improve lives in Kern County. So and my final thank you goes to Lorelei Oviat, who's always a champion for trying to make these things happen. And thank you, Lorelei, for when we come in with our crazy idea, um, figuring out how we can make this work. We really appreciate it. And with that, we're available to answer any questions that you might have about the program. I am really excited about this program. I heard about it a few months ago. It, it is a winner on so many sides. It's providing jobs. It's providing transition for people that have been the very hardest to place. Uh, it's a, a great brainchild. Uh, uh, it, it's just all the right pieces come together at the same time. So congratulations. I can't wait to see it be successful. And I'm, I'm just delighted that it's happening here in Kern County. Would anybody else like to say anything? S Supervisor Couch. I just want to uh, congratulate you on getting this program off the ground, but I also want to say that uh, Sal is the district director in the fourth district, so I'm proud to have him in our office now. Good job, best Sal. Of, great, great luck, or best of luck with this. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment? Well, let's hear from the public. Anybody in the public want to tell us anything about your, your views on this program? The uh, recommended action is to, we've had a, a hearing. Uh, the recommended action is to receive comment, close the hearing, and approve the creation of the project. So, so moved. Second. Excellent, please cast your votes. The motion is approved, four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Very good, thank you, congratulations. Appreciate your willingness to make a difference in our community. Let's go now to number seven on our agenda. That is on page three, and it is a report on the cannabis initiatives, measures J and K on our November 2018 uh, general election. Ms. Oviat, are you going to give us this report? Thank you, Chairman Maggart, members of the board. This matter is a completion of your request on July 24th, 2018 for a summary report on the details and potential impacts of the November 6, 2018 ballot measures on cannabis activities, which are now called Measure J and Measure K. This summary report has been provided to your board with this item and posted to our Planning and Natural Resources website. As noted in the cover page, this is not an endorsement of either initiative by any county department or by your board, and no position is being requested of your board on either of the initiatives today. I would like to point out some errata, um, corrections that I need to make to the report. Uh, they have been made to the report that's been posted online. First on page one, the date is not November 76, 2018, but November 6th. And on measure K on page two, the temporary lawful retail, which we're going to go over in detail on both these measures, is medicinal only, and the retail, it should say medicinal and adult use. So these errors will be corrected and the report reposted online. The report includes the official petition language, but not the summary that will be on the ballot. The public is directed to their sample ballots when they receive them in the mail for official language. 
The report goes into detail on the structure and organization of both these measures. This is a general look today at the differences, clarification of some misinformation that is provided by media coverage, and discussion of fiscal issues. So in a general way, both initiatives are an amendment of Title 19, which is the Kern County Zoning Ordinance. Title 19 is managed and interpreted by the Kern County Planning and Natural Resources Department with myself, the planning director, having your delegated authority for interpretation. If either one passes with 50% plus one vote, the current Section 19 section that bans medicinal and adult use can cannabis activities and regulates the temp lawful cannabis retail will be removed from the ordinance and no longer enforced. The, uh, these two initiatives will be voted on by people in the unincorporated community. So if you live in an unincorporated part of Kern County, you will see this on your ballot. If you live in an incorporated city, you will not see these two initiatives on your ballot. You may see other initiatives on your ballot if you live in the city of Bakersfield. Both in this initiatives specifically do not allow the total banning of cannabis activities. However, both include a variety of limitations on cannabis activities. So once this is passed by the voters, it is binding, and it is specifically states that it can only be amended by another vote of the people. However, there are portions of the initiatives that do allow your board to bring forward a variety of ordinances. So there are some places in the ordinances that they have delegated back to your board to decide if you want to uh, make some changes. Measure J is the Medicinal Cannabis Initiative by Ms. Epps, Mr. Jarvis, and Mr. Ganong. And Measure K is the Kern Regulation and Taxation of Cannabis Act of 2018 by Mr. Eilenberg and Mr. Godinas. Measure J is Medicinal Cannabis Only. And Measure K is Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis. So I want to do this in categories so that we can contrast uh, some of the similarities and differences. So first, retail dispensaries. So Measure J is medicinal only. And if you are a dispensary that is a current lawful temp category, and you are in that category on November 6, 2018, 1,000 feet from a school, a park, or a youth center, then if Measure J passes, the planning department would be required to issue a permit with no public hearing. Development standards such as parking, lighting, signage, and traffic requirements can be imposed, but no requirements beyond those already existing in the ordinance. And they would be required to get a building permit and a state license. There are an estimated 30 countywide with clusters that already exist in Oildale and Rosamond, and they would be required to be permitted. The Measure J states that beyond those, new revert to the state requirements of 600 feet from schools, parks, and youth centers, and your board could require a conditional use permit, and you could also adopt density limitations, such as limiting the number of these new CUPs in communities. Measure J does not allow mobile delivery. Measure K, which is retail dispensaries for medicinal and adult use, says that lawful temporary medicinal cannabis have two years in the same location to attempt to obtain a conditional use permit. All retail are required to get a conditional use permit under Measure K, and they are limited to 35 countywide. There is misinformation that, they, that retail is limited to the two commercial cannabis areas, which are mapped and we're going to talk about. That, is not in, that has been reported inaccurately by the media. The 35 retail in Measure K are countywide, but they require a conditional use permit. They have to be 1,000 feet from a school, a park, a large family daycare, a youth center. There are additional standards in Measure K that go beyond the state regulations and beyond the normal development standards and they do allow mobile delivery. They cannot be located on properties that have not been vacant for at least a year. So those are the two uh, contrasting uh, on the retail portion of Measure J and K. Cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and testing. We're just going to put those all in one category. In Measure J, it's medicinal only. It's allowed outdoors and indoors in all agricultural, industrial, and commercial with the exception of C1, which is neighborhood commercial. 
no public hearing, no specific standards past state licensing and current development standards. The initiative uses the definitions, type 1A, type 2 licenses with no uh, descriptions. So in this report, I have provided a table A that provides you a description of what those types of licenses are, and I've categorized them by zone districts. So on table A, you can look to see what's allowed in agricultural and what's allowed in these various commercial. As a reminder, the only commercial district where nothing is allowed is the C1 neighborhood commercial. The exception to public hearings is cultivation proposed within one mile of an existing farming operation. We can require a conditional use permit, but the processing fees are waived. The amount that all this would produce cannot actually be calculated, but it certainly could be beyond the 2 million square feet and the 150 acres of outdoor analyzed in the environmental impact report. I would note that these uh, activities of allowing outdoor and indoor in agricultural also includes the limited agricultural A1 district, which would allow unlimited outdoor and indoor. That district is mostly used by small lot rural communities on two and a half acre lots for residential use throughout the county. So there could be extensive outdoor and greenhouse cultivation with only a permit and no public hearing in these areas where these um, two and a half acre residential clusters are. Measure K is medicinal and adult use. Is permitted with only a site plan with development standards that are detailed and go beyond state law, building permits, and state license, but only in two commercial cannabis areas, both in the valley. So I'd like to show you a map of these two areas and go over the some statistics which are provided in the report. So this first area is at I-5, Tracy Avenue, and Sullivan Road. There's about 50 parcels here. It's a 1,025, a little bit over that, acres. And um, it is broken down through A, A1, C2PD, CHPD, which is both commercial, and then an industrial M2. There is a mobile home park designation of 26 acres which was not listed in the initiative, therefore on those 26 acres, cannabis would not be permitted. But any cultivation, indoor or outdoor, and any testing distribution or transportation would be required to go into this area or the second area I'm going to show you if they just want to go in without a public hearing and just with the development standards. The second area, The second, second area is northeast corner of Old River Road and Copus Road. There's 38 parcels. It's 3,835 acres. It is primarily zoned A. There's about two acres of commercial zoning, but the whole thing is zoned agriculture. If someone does not want to go into this area and they still want to cultivate, distribute, or test, the initiative provides that they could request a conditional use permit. A conditional use permit is discretionary. It, it requires a public hearing, and it could be either approved, denied, or conditioned. As noted, the existing temporary lawful retail, which are under this current ordinance for medicinal only, would be allowed to operate with a state license and a county land use permit for two years while seeking a conditional use permit, and there are approximately 30 of those. The new medicinal or adult use retail would require a conditional use permit and a state license. The setback would be larger than the state requirement. It would be 1,000 feet from school, park, large family daycare, use center. And that 1,000 feet and other requirements would be a requirement if they went into this commercial cannabis area. The amount that this would generate in distribution, manufacturing, and growing cannot be calculated, but limited limitations, as you saw on the number of acres, 
definitely go beyond the 2 million square feet and the 150 acres of outdoor. If all of Area 2, which is zoned A, had outdoor and indoor, it would be over 3,000 acres of uh, cannabis cultivation. And while both measures include new taxes and fees, they are different in how they are imposed and the amounts. Measure J defers to your board and provides that your board could, through a public hearing process, adopt up to a 7.5% business tax, but only on the adjusted gross income from cannabis activities. And as the gross income revenue will be adjusted down through deductions, and the number of locations is unknown, the amount collected cannot be estimated. Measure J also limits your board that you cannot put special fees on cannabis activities that exceed those set by the state. However, ordinance fees that apply to other businesses and normal cost recovery for staff time can be applied. And the exception, as I noted, is this conditional use permit for cultivation within a mile of an existing farming operation, the fees must be waived. I do note that one CUP, based on the controversial nature of this item, would cost the department from $6,000 to $20,000 or more. That's an impact to the general fund with other departments that review conditional use permits having unrecovered costs. Measure K includes fees and taxes that are very much more specific, and they are included in the initiative. So one, if the initiative passes, they are automatically applied. There's a $250 business permit application fees. And then there is a variety of fees tied to square footage that range from 50 cents up to $2 a square foot annually. The board may raise the fees up to 10% of the original amount every two years. And retail operations pay 5% tax on gross receipts. The initiative allocates this money as follows. 65% of the fees go to the general fund, 20% 20 goes to public safety, 15% goes to mitigate drug use, and any department that rejects the funding is redirected back to the general fund. Both measures would have impacts on public safety, the DA, probation, and a variety of departments. As noted in our environmental impact report, I saw nothing in these two initiatives that would change our recommendation that a cannabis activity enforcement task force would be necessary. The estimation for that task force is 1.2 million to 2.7 million a year or more, and no identified staffing has been uh, noted. So this would be new staffing. The total costs are unknown for public health and behavioral recovery services. However, Kern would become eligible for the new state cannabis funding, which I presented to your board uh, uh, that's being collected on taxes and distributed by the state. Uh, regarding personal use, uh, the, both initiatives affirm state law, however, uh, and they both allow outdoor cultivation for personal use in a locked enclosure that is not visible for public roadway. However, Measure J requires barbed wire, which is not currently allowed in residential zones, and deletes the locked exposure for residents in the agricultural or limited agricultural zone. The other requirements that were adopted, such as restrictions on use in parks or distances from public libraries and parks, were not included in this initiative, and therefore they would not be overturned. Those uh, are not in Title 19, and they were not mentioned, and therefore uh, those restrictions, which your board prudently placed on the use of cannabis in those locations, would remain. In conclusion, until the election results are certified, which is sometime in the middle of January, the Kern County ban ordinance remains in place. This department has provided this summary report, but I will not be explaining the initiatives any further than at this public hearing. I will not be presenting at any other forums, and I will not be making any final interpretations, either publicly or privately, of the meaning of the language in these initiatives. Uh, this completes my presentation. I know that the proponents and the initiatives are here, and so if there are questions I cannot answer, I'm sure they'd be happy to, and I am available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oviat. Colleagues, do you have any questions before we go to the public? Are there any members of the public this afternoon that would like to talk to us about uh, the report on cannabis initiatives J and K that we just received? Good afternoon. Could you please give us your name for the record? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the board. My name's Phil Ganong. Um, good afternoon, Lorelai. How are you? 
as, uh, just lost my brains, hang on a second. Uh, I'm the nominal author of J, and uh, also of Major O for the city. Vote yes on O. Sorry. <laughs> and I wanted to uh, comment on the description of these ordinances as, uh, or at least as uh, to J, uh, providing unlimited um, dispensaries or unlimited activities. Uh, last year I spoke to, where's my time? Oh, last year I spoke to... Um, Lori um, Ajax, who is the uh, director of the Bureau of Cannabis Control, I've had a, a couple of meetings with her, and discussed the problem that we had where BCC, uh, Bureau of Cannabis Control, was issuing licenses um, throughout the state, but Kern County and Bakersfield had, did not have any ability to, uh, to grant licenses or obtain licenses because the activity is prohibited in uh, both jurisdictions. And I was concerned about that, and I told her, you know, we've got these initiatives, and if they pass, are all the licenses going to be gone? And uh, what Ms. Ajax said was that they are, in essence, they're trying to ensure that uh, there's not an overpopulation or density of licenses that are issued in any geographical area. Um, they wanted to see that there was a, a, a fair distribution and that there was available access to the patient community for medicinal cannabis. Um, so the, the notion that there's going to be thousands of uh, dispensaries, and I think that's the, the, maybe the biggest concern that this uh, board has, uh, is not well founded because uh, the outside limit will be set by the Bureau of Cannabis Control, uh, and, and they will not issue uh, thousands of permits. We don't know how many they're going to issue, but they will regulate the number of permits that will be issued to the county. It's self-regulating. The other reason that J was uh, written as it is without caps is because caps are, they create a form of monopoly. Uh, if you have, if you're one of the lucky winners of the cap, um, you know, of the permit, uh, that means that you and 34 other shops are going to dictate uh, the cost and, uh, to the patient and also the quality to the patient and also the service that you give the patient. Uh, we believe that uh, good conservative traditions, good Republican traditions, if I may borrow that, of free market enterprise is a much better governing hand and allowing competition amongst uh, the dispensaries to weed out those who can't run a business, those who can't comply with state regulations and will be banned by the state uh, versus those who can run a business and know how to run it well and, and deliver uh, a low-cost quality product with good service, those are the businesses that are going to survive. And we don't think we need government intervention to tell us what the caps are. The public will tell us what the caps are by driving those people who can't deliver out of business. Um, the other issue that, that I had would, uh, and, I, and I think Ms. Oviat covered that, um, it, under J, uh, no commercial cannabis, act, medicinal cannabis activities, and J is just a medical cannabis bill, none of those activities are allowed in uh, neighborhood commercial areas. We were very sensitive to neighborhoods and we wanted to stay out of that. Uh, J, J does allow, excuse me, K does allow uh, development of, of uh, recreational cannabis uh, in the C1 uh, neighborhood areas. So, um, and I, I had a question, I understand the Soviet's estimate as to the uh, current, the expected cost of uh, the Cannabis Activity Task Force, um, I assume that's a task force that would be created and implemented to police or monitor the, the state regulated activity, I'm not sure. But I was just curious, do we have any idea what it currently costs the County of Kern for law enforcement uh, directed towards cannabis cultivation and dispensaries and, and litigation of that nature? I mean, it's one thing to say it's 1.7 to 2.5 for this task force, but uh, that figure, I think, um, should be compared to what does it cost us today under the current ban to enforce the ban. And I, I would suspect that the costs are higher today to enforce the ban than they would be under this task force. And also to point out that the state of California, although it has no uh, offices in Kern County, BCC has no office, the uh, CDFA has no office, they regulate uh, cultivation and the Department of Health Services which will regulate uh, consumables. They have no offices here for that purpose, um, but the point is we don't allow that activity here, it's illegal here, so there's no reason for them to establish an office if these 
uh, if this, uh, either of these pass, then uh, the BCC will have a presence here. Um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Ganon. <clears throat> Would you like to speak, ma'am? Good afternoon. You too. My name's Linda Jarvis. I also um, am here for Measure J. And I will tell you something that <laughs> has annoyed the heck out of me that has been mentioned numerous times about adjusted gross income when it comes to um, medicinal dispensaries. The only thing that is allowed by the federal government, because I have one of these businesses, and I know how much money I had to pay out and what they wanted me to pay out was for absolutely every employee. You're not allowed to deduct things with the federal government when it comes to cannabis businesses. So my employees, our workers comp, every other liability insurance, we paid medical insurance to our employees the location that we had, absolutely every business expense from a pencil to a computer to everything else is totally disallowed. The only thing that the federal government allows you to put on your taxes that are considered deductible is the actual little location where the product is being sold and the physical cost of your product. So all the other expenses that every business in this country is allowed to take, cannabis businesses are not. So our adjusted gross income, no matter whose business it is, if it's cannabis, it is going to be taxed at a very high rate. And the 7.5% that we're discussing here will be a lot of money to the county. That's all I got to say. If you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. Thank you, ma'am. Someone else have a question? Thank you. Hi, how are you, Chairman? Good afternoon. This is Aton Wallace with 17 News. How are you, Ms. Oviat? Good to see you guys. Um, question, I'm sorry to do this up here. I want to make sure you, I want to make sure the media gets it right. And you mentioned there's a few things we've gotten wrong. So I do have a question. What, are you able to go into one more time, what were the two land, two places in land uh, where we've been, or, or the media has not been reporting accurately, and what is the accurate information there again? I, I lost it, and I want to make sure we get that correctly, get that correct. We'll, we'll answer your question for you in a few minutes. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there other comments? Good afternoon, Ms. Bedard. Mary Bedard, Registrar of Voters. I just wanted to clarify something that's stated in the report. It states that these initiatives will be voted by on by the voters of unincorporated Kern County, and they will be voted on by uh, voters countywide. So. so is it your position that uh, the measures J and K will be on the ballot for all voters, whether they live in an unincorporated area of Kern County or they live in an incorporated city? That's correct. Ms. Zofia, that's a significant difference in your understanding. Can we flesh that out a bit? Chairman Maggard, I received that from County Council. Um, our understanding is the City of Bakersfield's initiative is voted on by the city and the county initiatives, and so I got that from County Council. Okay, we were, also, we were told initially by County Council that it would be countywide. GK, can you give us any clarification? That's a significant difference. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been in contact with Mr. Nations. Uh, I don't know if there's been a miscommunication, but uh, Ms. Bedard's position is the correct one. The, the, uh, the ballots of all residents will contain measures J and K. Um, only unincorporated voters will vote on the 1% sales tax, which is measure I, and that's by virtue of the government code. Um, because there's a provision that allows for that. But there's no such government code that uh, restricts J and K. So that will be for all residents. So if there is a resident of the city of Bakersfield, for example, would they vote on measures J and K and, I didn't catch what the O, o is the ballot measure for the city of Bakersfield. They would have an opportunity to vote on all three of those? That's my understanding, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, that's significant. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Bedard. Yes, sir, did you have a comment, sir? All right, uh, my name is Timothy Blakely, B-L-A-K-E-L-E-Y, with the Current Medical Cannabis Association and with uh, Diamond Collective out in Roseman. Um, a lot of times we don't talk about what the, the benefits of these measures are. A lot of times we get stuck talking about the negatives. Um, you know, in the EIR, I believe the taxes that would be received by Kern County are nearly $40 million. It's 39 and some change. And the potential job growth brings in nearly 9,000 jobs. And this is just what the early numbers are. And it's not, you know, actual numbers. They can actually go quite larger than that. Um, that includes the 7.5% tax that's included in Measure J, as well as, I believe, the money that will be collected from the state of California for removing the ban. Because as we all know right now, with the ban in place, we get nothing from the state of California. Um, and we can really use that, that money here in Kern County as far as regulations are concerned. Um, I believe that Measure J does a better job at regulating cannabis. It's medical only. It's easier to regulate medical cannabis because there are so many pre-made uh, procedures in place because we've been doing medical since 96. So a lot of the um, industry establishments and where we need to be are already built in to medical. Um, as far as K is concerned, I just don't think that recreational is appropriate right now, especially for people who are just barely touching bases on getting a hold of the medical side of it. And I think that all of you agree too, we're more about it for the patients than having a bunch of fun with it anyways. Um, I don't like my medicine being put in the same category as like a party drink, like a beer, you know? I don't, I don't like that. And uh, so I would hope that you all would take a real close look at both of these measures and see how they benefit the county the most and our communities the most. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blakely. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman, board members. Uh, Gabriel Godinas on behalf of Measure K. Just a point of clarification, I wanted to express first, I want to say thank you to, to Lorelai for uh, giving the breakdown. She did an accurate and a good job breaking down what the similarities and differences are. So thank you. I just want to clarify, uh, Measure K allows for 35 storefront collectives. Currently, I believe the county has 28 or 29 on the legal non-conforming list. <clears throat> so you're looking at an increase, slight increase there possibly. Mr. Goodong was correct as, as far as how the state is going to regulate the density uh, for those particular uh, licenses. So that's another protection that, that we have. But a point of clarification, the, uh, the C1 that's approved for the storefront, which is a neighborhood commercial, we already have some of those in place already. So I want to make sure that was clear. It's not going to be deemed that there would be an increase because these other ones would be subjected to a CUP process. Well, Measure, measure J, well, they would not. So thank you for your time. Mr. Godinez, could you answer a question for me? Is there an, do you have an estimate of how much revenue you think Measure K would generate? Uh, measure, no, we do not. Uh, what we would go off of, we would go off the numbers essentially that were provided in the environmental impact report. As those were, the square footage was much less. So it would be, we would anticipate something to that effect, but not, nothing that I can give you with uh, certainty. Thank you, sir. Are there any other members of the public that would like to ask a question or make a comment about the report? Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing, return to the board. Ms. Oviat, could you answer the question that uh, uh, the KGET reporter had regarding this clarification about location? Yes, thank you. Chairman Maggers, members of the board. Measure K has these two areas called commercial cannabis areas. In a number of news reports, uh, the statement was made that dispensaries can only go into those commercial cannabis areas, leaving people under the impression that there would be no retail establishments any place but in those two areas. That is not accurate. 
the 35 conditional use permits countywide can go outside those areas, just have to have a public hearing to go into those, um, uh, for those locations. That does not mean that there might not be dispensaries inside those commercial cannabis areas, but that was a number of news reports that made that inaccurate, and certainly that would have an impact on communities' um, determination of how this measure could affect them. So what would be the activity that would be restricted to within these two designated areas? Growing in greenhouses, growing outdoors, manufacturing, which is creating the oils, uh, distribution, which is the large warehouses where you move it, and testing. Very good, thank you. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, yes you're welcome. Okay, uh, colleagues, do you have any other questions or concerns? Yes, uh, Supervisor Scrivener, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, this is a, a question for County Council. So, um, Mr. Calsa, if the if all the residents of the county, whether you're in an incorporated city or in the unincorporated cal county areas, will be voting on J and K, if one or if one of those passes, I know. It's one or the other, whichever gets the most votes, I believe, is the way it works. Um, if, if one passes, how does that impact the bans that are in place for the incorporated cities um, other than the city of Bakersfield, which will have its own, um, its own measure on the ballot, and that one's O? So how does, that, how does that impact the other incorporated cities in the county? If they don't have a, a measure that's on specifically for them, but they will be voting on J and K. I'm sure a lot of them will be wondering how that will impact them. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Scribner, through the chair. This is not a matter that I've looked at. Um, and uh, my understanding of how this is, uh, how these uh, ordinances are laid out is that um, uh, the, uh, the county ordinance may not have an impact. But I, I, again, this is not something that I've looked at, and I apologize for my office. Uh, the individual who is most conversant with this is Mr. Nations, and he's dealt with uh, the planning department. I would defer to Ms. Oviat if she has information, uh, but this is not something that I have looked at. Supervisor Scrivener through the chair, I appreciate uh, Ms. Bedard and County Council clarifying that because we've gone back and forth. But these initiatives were specifically written to amend Title 19 of the Kern County Zoning Ordinance, and that ordinance does not apply to city property. Okay, thank you. Any other questions by members of the board? Uh, Supervisor Scrivener, I'm sorry, Supervisor Gleason. I just gotta, I, I, I know we're frustrated by this, but I need to understand. So if I'm living in the city of Bakersfield, I'm gonna place a vote on what's gonna happen outside my jurisdiction, but can't happen inside my jurisdiction. Is that correct? That is correct based on this uh, direction from council and elections that this would be on their ballot, along with measure O, which does affect what happens in their city. So I could vote against O and pro J or pro K. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Recommended action is to receive and file the report. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to ask County Council to get us some information specifically on the city question. So if you, if you live in Ridgecrest, for instance, or the city of Tehachapi, you'll be voting on J and K, but it will not impact you in the jurisdiction of your particular city. So why are they gonna vote? I, I'd, like to get, um, I'd like to get some more information from Council on that, please, and other than in addition to voting to receive and file this report. Thank you. We can provide that to Mr. Scrivener through the chair. We can provide that. Thank you. Supervisor Couch, are you comfortable expanding your motion to include that language? Sure. I don't need that as part of the motion. I'm just saying I'd, okay. like, I'd like to get some information from, from okay. staff. Yes, right. I don't want to, I don't want to convolute don't this. Don't muddy that. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay, so we have a request for more information. That, will, will that be forthcoming to us in a week or two? I think it'll be forthcoming to you in a day or two, Mr. A day or two, okay. B ballots go out when, Ms. Bedard? 
I, I think it's the week of the 8th, I believe, so. Okay. Very good. Uh, we have a motion. I believe we have a second. Do we not, Madam Clerk? Yes. That's to receive and file the report. Please cast your votes. Can I ask a question, please? So yes, all we're, all we're, when we say receive and file, what does that mean? Just noting for the record that we have received the report. Okay. It, it is not any form of uh, affirmation or uh, okay. any comment as to the content or the Chairman, nature of it. Chairman Maggard, if I may, for Supervisor Gleason. On the cover of this report, which you have, is a large disclaimer. This report is not endorsed by the Board of Supervisors. There's no selection of the initiatives. There's no selection by my department and no interpretation. So we did put a disclaimer on the report. Thank you. The motion is approved. Four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the last item for the afternoon is item number 20, which is a proposed resolution for the exchange of tax revenues related to the city of McFarland annexation number 15 through LAFCO. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, it's recommended that your board adopt the attached resolution authorizing the auditor controller county clerk to process the necessary transactions in accordance with agreement 535-2018 with the city of McFarland for the exchange of tax revenues. Um, this annexation, you should know, meets the criteria of the master revenue exchange agreement between our county and the city of McFarland. Uh, um, that said, we, we would like to uh, simply express our concerns regarding any action uh, that we take that would expand city services and increase costs related to fire protection. Uh, to that end, uh, we're greatly looking forward to working with the fire chief and the city uh, to uh, figure out a long-term sustainable working relationship and contractual arrangement for fire services. Uh, I should say the city is also uh, fully uh, current with its, uh, its uh, payment under their uh, discounted two-year contract uh, with our county. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alsop. Are there members of the public that would like to speak with regard to item number 20? Okay, I'll return to the board then. Um, board, what is your direction for staff? I'll move the staff's recommendation. Staff's recommendation is just to provide direction, so. Right. The direction is to uh, send the letter to LAFCA. Adopt the resolution. Chairman Maggard, Supervisor of Couch, that's correct. Very good, adopt the resolution, which authorizes that to be done. Okay, I'll we have a, that. I'll second that and congratulate uh, Supervisor Couch for the good work. Congratulations. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, four ayes, one absent. Supervisor Perez. Madam Clerk, I believe that that concludes our items other than we have an opportunity that we afford the public every time we meet to give us any comments they have on matters not otherwise on our agenda. Are there any members of the public that would like to make comment to us this afternoon? Not seeing anyone, I will close that item and uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, without objection, so ordered. We'll see you in two weeks, I believe. Right, Madam Clerk? Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>